Job, the book of Job in the Old Testament, which is uh, Hebrew poetry. And uh, in the book of Job, this is chapter 38. So by the time we got to chapter 38, there's been a lot going on. <laughs> and a lot of, uh, Job's been through a lot of suffering. That's why they call it the sufferings of Job. And uh, long story short, you, you kind of think, well, maybe God's going to explain to him the reasons for suffering and why things happen to him that way. And what we find is that God really doesn't do that. He doesn't really feel like he has to explain himself. So um, now there's lots of theological, philosophical conversation about suffering as you go through the book. But this is how God answers Job, which is quite interesting. And it's about creation. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther. Here is where your proud waves halt. May God add to our hearts the blessings from this reading of his word. Shall we pray? Lord, except you build the house, those who build it labor in vain. Lord, we can talk, we can sing, but unless you, by your grace, do miracles in our hearts, we will not change. So we pray for miracles, Lord, that as we consider your word today, you would uh, soften our hearts to the truth that sets us free. We would understand a little bit more about the importance of creation and of uh, your redemption, O Christ. So we lift uh, this time into your hands. We pray this in your name, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So I've called this uh, Creation Matters, or Matters of Creation, if you will. <laughs> it goes both ways, you see. Cre creation Matters or Creation Matters. <laughs> so uh, uh, basically, I, I, I kind of got inspired, but this is one of the scripture readings for today, was this, this Job passage. And I love talking about creation, as many of you may know. <laughs> I get a creation magazine, and actually I get two different creation uh, ministries that send me put their publications and books and stuff so uh, I've been curious about it. I've had huge arguments with people about it over the years I'm not going to really talk about how creation happened today just why it matters a lot of people say well you know pfft. you know that, that doesn't really you can believe what you want and but and today there's kind of a, a certain amount of voice out there that's like the creation really isn't a thing things just came into existence by happenstance over long periods of time and I would argue that is not true. And that is evidently not true. It's evident that it's not true. So I'm going to talk about creation matters. But first I want to look, about, look at this uh, passage from Job a little bit. Um, the background to Job. So Job, as I mentioned, 38, chapter 38. So in those th first 37 chapters, most of it is this conversation of Job with his friends. And friends is in quotation marks. Because <laughs> they weren't very friendly to him. They were explaining to him why he had all these problems. So he lost everything. He lost all his family, except for his wife. She was around, but she'd said, curse God and die. And he, he said, empty I came into this world, and empty I'm going to leave it. Blessed be the name of the Lord, which is that song we sing, you know, blessed be your name. And uh, so, uh, so he, but he's lost all his possessions, and he was like the wealthiest guy in the world-ish, something like that. So uh, he's got nothing. And so then, and, and in the beginning of the book, we're told that Satan is allowed to destroy his life. And Satan comes back and, and he says, well, he's got, still got his health, God. And God says, well, take, take his health then. So we find Job in an ash heap, scraping the boils off his body with a pot shirt, which is not a very pretty sight. So th that's where he is. And then, and then his friends come to comfort him, which means they tell him why he was, uh, why he was suffering. It's because he was such a bad guy, <laughs> and because he needs to repent and so on. And he says, yeah, I don't think it's that this time. And so they have these long discussions, four, four friends, actually, it turns out. So then, at the end, when you think maybe God's going to reveal to him all the stuff that's going on, this is what, got, what happens. 
God shows up in a whirlwind, and he says, then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm, a whirlwind. And that's, I don't know if you can see that. That's Job down in the bottom corner there. Can you see him? I'm just, I'm just kind of trying to get my machine working here. There he is. If you look closely, you can see his boils. You may not want to. <laughs> Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. <laughs> right? Okay. So then he challenges him with respect to creation. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. So then we have a little bit of a, a kind of a view of the earth's foundation. This, if you were to take the earth and cut it like a grapefruit, it would be, look something like this, right? So the heart is the, the molten core, and then there's these... You know, the geologists have all the, the, the different layers named. I forget what they all are. Mantle, the crust, as you go out. So, uh, but it, it's, it's a wonderful, amazing thing that we really still don't know that much about. So Job's question stands today. You know, tell me all about this. You know, how, how, how did I do that? How did I put that together? Um, where were you when I laid the Earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. <laughs> Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? So he's using the language of building, like you would build a big temple back in those days or build a huge palace or something. Uh, so he says, yeah, how did that work for you? And then, he, then the next chunk is, you know, this picture of kind of the dark ocean uh, with, with darkness around it. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When, it made the, when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness? When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. Okay? So this is, you know, that's, so, so his answer was simply, I'm the creator. <laughs> you, know, you really don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I do, because, you know, I have far deeper understanding than you can imagine. Uh, so that may not be satisfactory to everybody, but... I wanted to think a little bit more about that today. What, it's just, you know, why? So, so if, m most of the, this is mostly a picture show. So I'm glad that everything's working today because you get to see beautiful slides of God's good creation. This is the African uh, uh, savanna, I guess, with uh, some zebras there. Why does creation matter? Why does it matter? And I've got some reasons here, and I'm going to list off. Let's just look at this from that's happening right now. I don't know if you noticed that. You may have some of those around your yard. There's a lot of robins around this year, and they've been laying eggs. One, creation matters because it's one of the main ways that God reveals himself. That God tells people, I'm here. <laughs> I exist. And, uh, I mean, I say one of them because I think there are others. I think God, God has actually instilled it within our, our breasts, within our being. Within, it's intuitive. Uh, but beyond that, it's apparent to our senses. And uh, I, I think that's self-evident, myself, uh, and, and Scripture would agree with me. Oh, they've arrived. It's all good. So this is a, a quote from Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, this is the New Testament, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Romans 1.20. So the, the declaration of Scripture, this is St. Paul inspired by God's Spirit, as I believe, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his, his godness, his divine nature, his divinity, and his power have been clearly perceived, being understood from what has been made, in other words, the creation, what has been formed so that people are without excuse. Interesting. So already we have the hint of accountability here, based on creation, which is an, it was an important thing. And that's my next point, partly. This is a man and a woman in a garden. Hmm. That may ring a bell. We know, you know, so this is why creation matters. When, when, when we understand that it, it, there is a creator and that he made the, everything, then we know this, that we too were made by him. We know that we are made by God, owned by God, 
That's the corollary of being made by God, by the way. Owned, made, therefore owned, and therefore accountable to God for our lives. And, and that's all built into the idea of creation. If God made us, we belong to him, and we're accountable to him. It all, it's, it just, it's like a logical follow. And that's an important, really important assertion there. Um, so where do we find this kind of stuff? Well, we find it very early. Oh, there's that garden. Uh, very early in Scripture, first chapter of the Bible, male and female, he created them. That's pretty simply put. <laughs> he made them, i.e., he made us. Genesis 1. So that's the created part, then the accountability part. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. So there's a whole lot of theological inferences in that, which we're not going to go into today. Gen this is from the second chapter of Genesis. But basically God laid, set a line and said, you know, this is what I don't want you to do. And if you do it, there will be, uh, there will be um, repercussions, there will be consequences. You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. So this is our accountability to God. Okay, so that's, uh, that's uh, point two, what, why creation matters. Point three, here we are, hole in the corn, or weeding it. And this is very much in the first couple of chapters of Genesis. We have been charged with the care of the earth. So when we realize that this is this is the creation of God and we are part of that creation, this almost begins to fall because we are clearly, you know, we have more wisdom and more uh, ability and more resources than any of the other creatures that we see on this earth. Therefore, we have been charged with the care of the earth. Lest we, we think that might be true, scripture clearly states it to us. So here's, here's some teeming fish, which are described in Genesis 1. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So that's pretty closely related to God. <laughs> We're to be his children, right? So that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So, so the commission here is very comprehensive. It's like, all the creatures, you're in charge. And remember the King James Version, he, may, he says they, they may have dominion, right? They may have dominion over the fish in the sea and so on. This one says they may rule over. And so somewhere along the line, humanity being what it is, has kind of twisted that to say, oh, we have dominion, we're the boss, we can do whatever we like. And that is not God's intention, and that's clear from all of Scripture, including this. And it's just, it just makes common sense. I mean, Jesus, when, when Jesus starts to talk about authority, he says, whoever will be greatest among you must be the least of all and the servant of all. So y you have the care for those that you're, you're charged with. You're not to use them and abuse them. I mean, it's the same thing when we have children. We have the, we have the rule over our children. We have dominion over our children. So are, does that mean we oppress them and make them slaves? I don't think so. Our gut tells us we intuitively know we're in charge of caring for them, of protecting them, of nurturing them, of, of helping them be all that they were meant to be, right? And that's exactly what God is talking about here when he says uh, that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds, that we may manage this world. That was Genesis 1. Back to Genesis 2 again. That was a beautiful farm, right? Genesis 2, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. <laughs> Couldn't be stated much more clearly than that, right? So at this point, you guys are being very quiet, but Inglesby, they weren't so quiet. And some lady should say, well, we haven't done a very good job of it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We haven't. I mean, to some degree, we have. Some, you know, we, we've done lots. Humanity has done some good management choices through, through the centuries but we've done an awful lot of wrong things that, that are destructive and violent. And, and so that, that's the next segue. <laughs> because it's so beautiful and we've been, we've been entrusted with it and we messed up, redemption is necessary. So this is a, this is a scene of war-torn Croatia after a fairly recent war. And that's just typical down through the centuries of man's treatment of man, humanity to humanity. We've been killing each other off. We've been waging war. 
We've been polluting the environment. We've been hostile to each other. We've had walls up. We've abused one another. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, this is sin. I don't want to go into it in, in great depth today, but, but creation, that wasn't God's intention when he created us or created this world. So redemption is necessary from God's point of view. I've got to do something about this, and they can't. We are helpless to do much about it for ourselves. So God enters into history, and, and, and Christ dies on the cross. So this is, I mean, Christ dying on the cross is the centerpiece of Christian faith, Christian belief. It's the sign of our faith, for Pete's sake. But, but my point today is, you know, it doesn't make sense without the creation narrative in behind it. It just doesn't work. I mean, unless we are created by God and therefore owned by God and therefore accountable to God, we don't need a Redeemer. If we're just, you know, happenstance creatures or beings in a world that sometimes do right, sometimes do wrong. But if we're way off track, we're derailed, we're off the, off the tracks, and God decides and desires to put us back on the track. He, he has taken pains, literally, and, and, and by his own volition has entered into history to, to rectify this thing. And that's what we're all about, what the Christian faith is all about. Paul sums it up like this in Romans 3. He says, for there is no distinction. He's actually talking about Jews and Gentiles here, but he says, there's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody here this morning in this room, I know for a fact, has sinned. <laughs> and if, if anybody wants to challenge me on that, <laughs> I'll take you up on it, but <laughs> it's a losing battle. You know, we, we may think, oh, uh, well, you know, I think I'm kinder than that person, my neighbor. You know, they don't seem to care about people much. Or I think I'm more generous than the other one over here because they don't seem to give much. And, you know, we do that little comparative thing, don't we? So he adds to that. He says, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. <laughs> so, so the comparison isn't about you and I with each other. It's about God himself. We've fallen short of the glory of God. So the height, the, the, the measure that we're to attain is, is unattained by each and every one of us. And so, you know, we are justified. In other words, we're forgiven, we're restored, we're redeemed as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So that's the wonder and the scandal of the cross and of the Christian faith. We're all messed up, we're all broken, we're all sinful, none of us, no exceptions, and Christ dies for us so that we can be completely forgiven, that our slate wiped clean, justified. Justified means righteousified in the eyes of God. And that's a gift. It's just given to us when we put our faith in Christ. And that's the beginning of the restoration of creation because the deep source of the problem is sinfulness and the brokenness of the human creature. Being justified is a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So that was four. Uh, there needs to be redemption. And then five, and this is my last point, really. Uh, creation matters because God plans to restore it, put it back to rights, make it beautiful and perfect again. And that's one of the whole big themes of, of the Bible. And it, you know, it starts with creation, and it ends with new creation, the restoration. It starts in Genesis, it ends in Revelation. The last couple of chapters of Revelation says, I saw the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven from God, like a bride adorned for its husband. We saw a bride yesterday here in the church. It was, it's always a wonderful reminder. You know, coming down from heaven to earth. And it says, behold, God is with people. And uh, heaven and earth are brought together again in, in, in God's restoration of his creation and transformation. But he will create a new heavens and a new earth, Peter says, in which righteousness dwells. So here's a little glimpse from, again, our Old Testament uh, uh, imagery. The, the lion will lie down with the lamb, right? in a beautiful paradise. A little glimpse, artist's conception of what the new heavens and the new earth might be. But all that talk of the new heavens and the earth isn't in, even in the New Testament. Well, it is in the New Testament. It doesn't start there, though. It comes from the Old Testament. Isaiah 65. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. So God's whole aim in this thing is to bring about, you know, he, creation and then to bring about new creation. And Christ is the key. He's the, he's the doorway from the first to the second, from the beginning to the end. So, there you go. 
Creation is foundational for everything we believe. It's so important. That it, and then only because of creation and because of the brokenness of creation does redemption make sense. And then because redemption has begun in us and God plans to, to complete it, restoration stands on top of that, which is our hope and our dream and our longing of our hearts to be part of that. Uh, as Paul talks about in Romans 8, we had it read at uh, Presbytery this week. You know, the, the whole creation longs with expectation. It groans like in, the, like in uh, birth pangs, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. So that's, uh, that's my message. Hope it gets stuck in your head. <laughs> that's where some of us might rather be at any given time. It looks a bit Algonquin Parkish, I think. Creation... Hmm? Yeah. Or just around the bend here somewhere. Creation does matter. Shall we pray?